Could Sergio Perez outperform Lance Stroll in a Red Bull? Why has Dominic paused his friendship with Lewis Hamilton? All that coming up and more on today's episode of Tinfoil Helmets. Welcome to your occasional spicy hot take roundup of all the latest F1 rumors, all with the almost believable conspiracy theories to back them up. We've researched everything here for hours to make sure it's totally founded in logic, reasoning, and truth. Or not, who knows. So, um, that was a race. That was a race. But before we talk about that, we should talk about whether we got anything right before we go into the details. Uh, yes, obviously the first uh, prediction we had was Max does not wrap up the title. Um, he could have uh, wrapped it up by not even showing up this weekend. He could have done. But I think it's important to note that in the sprint race this weekend, he was not on pole. So there was definitely a chance that something could have happened. Uh, I would agree with that chance if the uh, if his title contender competition was not like eight spots behind him. True. True. Uh, and just as a quick aside, uh, do you feel like Max won this title or Perez lost this title? Uh, I'm going to why not both dot gift this because I think he did win it. Uh, as Lewis said, he did an amazing drive this year. But I do think that Perez also lost it. He left a lot on the table. There was a um, on the the walk the, the kind of grid chat before the race. They were chatting with Adrian Newey, who he says he has now made twenty five championship winning cars. Holy crap! Uh, that's a lot of cars <laughs> that have won championships. Uh, and you know, he said this was one of the more easier ones. <laughs> uh, next item on the list. Uh, George and Lewis in fifth and sixth and take each other out after George out qualifies Lewis again. Uh, I was, I'm going to, I think this deserves, you said this is a half point, but I think this is a full point. The only thing I'm not, I did not get right was fifth and sixth. And actually, if you reflect back on it, it if it weren't for the stupid laps being deleted and then whoever it was that got the their time deleted after the fact, I think it would have been even close. I think it would have been fourth and sixth. It would have been really close. So... I, I think I get at least a point nine five on this one. I would just like to say that before the race, when you and I were texting each other, uh, you shared uh, like a Mercedes team tweet of like, we're going to race this together sort of thing. And my immediate reaction was together into turn one. And I have not laughed as loud as I have and as long as I have for a while when they hit each other in turn one. I That was absolutely hilarious to me. Oh yeah, I I I can I I also laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and nearly missed the rest of the race, but thankfully there was a safety car, so I could keep on laughing. It was great. And uh, the last prediction was uh, Logan Sargent gets fired before Qatar. Nope, but he did retire during Qatar, so you know he did. He did. And I have to say credit to the Williams team. I thought they were being um, very supportive, although I questioned their motives uh, with his desire to potentially retire the, from the race early. Um, credit to them for not pushing the driver too hard yeah and I, I think at the time i was like oh the guy from florida can't hang in the heat and humidity and then you read about all the drivers after the race and it's like oh no logan made the same call that that's the right thing to do yep 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 and especially as apparently he had flu-like symptoms earlier in the week so he was probably already you know only at 90 percent versus everybody else's 100 percent. yep anyway we should do some between race drama before we segue into qatar yes uh, the first point here, we have Yuki does not want to go to Aston Martin. He wants to be in a car that has performance, a.k.a. the Red Bull. Uh, I thought this was quite interesting because the assumption has been that Honda's um, team up uh, with their new BFFs, Aston Martin, has implied and been heavily suggested that basically it's Yuki's seat to lose. Um, but the implication here from this interview in the race is that actually maybe he doesn't want to go there because actually he's not convinced the car's going to be any good and he believes in the Red Bull, uh, what's the word people use? The Red Bull Project. I'm not sure this is the best place for Yuki. Uh, having seen Lawson actually do, well, the, today uh, or yesterday, did pretty good against Yuki. I'm, I'm not sure that this is the right call for Yuki to be making. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, next one on the list uh, is Lance... And we'll talk more about Lance. But is Lance going to end up in uh, the World Endurance Championships after the surprise announcement, surprising nobody, uh, from Aston Martin that they'll be taking their Valkyrie car, co-designed with Adrian Newey, another world championship on his list coming up, um, to the World Endurance Championship in 2025, conveniently for when Lance has taken a year out to recuperate from a challenging year in F1. Uh, that year out might be coming sooner than later, but we're going to get to that. Um, 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I think we knew this car was coming and was going to be in WEC for some time. My only comment is I thought it was going to be earlier. But yeah, it, it looks like a pretty cool car. Yeah, I mean, the car, you can buy the car, though, as Max got done for driving it illegally the other week. Like, the police were coming after him because apparently he drove it through a tunnel and didn't have both hands on the steering wheel and used his phone or something. I can't remember what it was. It wasn't like he was driving like an idiot that got him. It was like, you know, the, the those um, those rules that many people ignore, but maybe you probably shouldn't ignore. Um, but it's a car that you can buy, so I think it's just their adaptations for WEC that require time. And if you're going to ignore those rules of the road, which we at Tinfoil Helmets do not endorse you doing, make sure you don't post it to social media. Indeed, especially, even worse, don't record it. Yes. You don't have to just not post it to social media. Just don't record it because they'll find it in Discovery. Right. Uh, Next item on the list, uh, Lewis actually did a track walk. Uh, Lewis, famed for many years, saying he doesn't do track walks anymore because he doesn't find any value in it, um, actually did a track walk at this track, which in some respects is even more amusing than I don't do track walks and then doing a track walk because he won here the last time they were out. So it's not like he's completely unfamiliar with the track. Um, but there's video footage of him on his little scooter zooming around the track. There was uh, new curbs and like they did a whole repayment of it, right? They did, but they didn't re they didn't um, change the track until Saturday. Um, so that's why I say like you knew you know how it went. Like you don't you can go and stand out in one part of it and scrape it with your finger. You don't need to walk around the whole track. Well, maybe maybe it's a different thing on like turn four than turn one. Who knows? Who knows? And we will never know because we've never been allowed on an F1 track. That would be very cool if they they paved the track differently in different sectors. <laughs> Isn't that Austin where they like repaved the S's and didn't do the rest of the track? And then they just went around grinding out the other bits of the track because they were too cheap? Something like that, yeah. It's got, it's got all the lumps in it and there's one bit that's been repaved but another bit that hasn't. Monaco as well. I bet you Monaco is pretty much, you know, it's, like, it's a patchwork of choice. Uh, Azerbaijan as well. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, okay, the other between ways drama that we have here is all about this uh, rumored, suggested potential eleventh team, the Andretti team. Uh, what for? Uh, the FAA gave them the seal of approval. They're in, maybe. We still have to go through Formula One management and Liberty Media, if I recall correctly. Yes, and I believe it's been stated a few times now that the other teams do not have a direct vote slash say in this it is entirely up to f1 so despite the fact that we've heard lots of rumors from many teams saying oh i don't really want that um like i think williams was complaining this week about it and then um somebody i think it was was it Haas or somebody else said that they, we've already got an american team we don't need another one toto's whined about it multiple times all because they don't want the money diluted but apparently they don't have any control it's all up to Stef- stefano well we already have a british team why do we have two british teams why do we have three British teams? We, no, four, four. How many te- British teams do we technically have? We Red Bull, Mercedes, Red Bull, Williams, Red Bull's Austrian, McLaren. Red Bull's Austrian. Well, okay, then then Mercedes is German, so I think we've only got two British teams. We there's three. There's Aston Martin, McLaren, and Williams are the British teams. Oh yeah, Aston Martin. Is Aston Martin really a British team? Uh, it's owned by an American. They are Canadian. Sorry, Canadian. Oh yeah. Whoops. Don't write in about that. Sorry. Bad words. I'm my mistake. I don't know. We could actually use the uh, somebody to write in something about this podcast at some point in time. Indeed, if you have a formal complaint, please write in. Uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, they are officially registered as a British racing team. So is Red Bull officially registered as a British racing team? No, they're Austrian. But their entire base of operations is in, is in England. Yeah, well... None no, of what they do is in Austria. I mean, yeah, but most of the racing teams are all based in... Like, but they're nine of the, with the assumption of Ferrari and uh, what, um, Alpha Tauri, aren't they all based in England? No, Alpha Tauri is based in Italy. Ferrari's in Italy. Uh, Sauber is in um, Switzerland. Um, Haas technically is based in North Carolina and England and Italy. They're everywhere. And then I think everybody, else, oh, and Enstone, they're also based in England, but they get their cars from, they get their engines from the French. Um, so. <laughs> Um, this is like when you have a sports person that happens a lot in the United Kingdom. When they're doing badly, they're in another country. And when they're doing well, they're in the country that you currently favour. Such as, I think, Andy Murray was like, he's Scottish by birth, but he plays for England when he's doing well. And when it's not, he's the Scottish player. You know, all that type of stuff. He's a, he's Scottish until he wins Wimbledon, then he was British. Exactly. Um, I think the other interesting part of this story is Lewis, because he likes to speak to the man and is always being taken out by the other side. Uh 
said that uh, he thinks that there should be another team in F1. Be damned what the powers that be think about this. Which I think was a secret message to Toto telling them that he's going to bring his own team at some point. Uh, I think the curious thing in all this wasn't actually Lewis's comment, but uh, Christian Horner's comment if he thinks uh, Andretti Cadillac should build their own engine because Ford is coming back into Formula One, I think, with Red Bull in the future. Yeah, yeah they sponsored. They, they sponsored and said we will work on the engine. Right. Uh, so Christian Horner, totally probably not for his own reasonings to make sure the team is slightly nuked when they start, thinks Cadillac should build the uh, build their engines as well. Who is supplying their engines? Uh, Renault? Uh, I think it would have to, at this point, unless I had to deal with somebody, it would have to be Renault because the, um, it's the team with the lowest number of customers would get the would get the obligation unless they can work out a deal with somebody else. Got it. And I don't think Mercedes would do that. I'm pretty sure Red Bull don't want to give their engines away. Yeah. Ferrari? That seems a bad idea for Cadillac, though. Yeah, on like the one hand, like with Cadillac and Ford, you could think like, oh, you know, the American team's going at it together, but then it's also... Uh, Ford versus GM, and the Australians would never know what to do with themselves. Indeed, they'd be very confused, especially when they needed to get a ute. That would uh, just to confuse the Australian fans. That would be hilarious if Ford and GM team up. They wouldn't know what to do. Indeed, it'd be amazing. Uh, shall we check on our career guidance segment, occasionally called "Does Blank Still Have a Job"? I would like to rename this segment for this week because I can't bring myself to. Lance Stroll had a pretty no good, terrible, bad weekend, and I can't bring myself to say that many negative things about him. So I think we should change the segment today to what other job should blank have? Because... That's, that's why I say career guidance. Oh, career guidance. Because, like, we can definitely say that Lance, it, it was... It very clearly looks like he had a talking to between the weekends with how frustrated he was in quali. Um, allegedly pushing a trainer. We didn't see him push a trainer. Um, conveniently blocked uh somebody well it's like he knew that where the cameras couldn't go um exactly yeah uh but i think uh lance could be a very interesting team principal for aston martin but in the short term i I don't think so i think he needs time away uh maybe maybe he does but or at least maybe he starts at maybe some sort of shadowing position inside at the base at silverstone but you know you think of racing drivers who haven't necessarily had the greatest success being racing drivers and then they go on to become amazing team principals such as christian horner true toto wolf yeah and and, you know i think i think lance as much as we kind of give him some crap on his driving i think he does probably have enough wherewithal of what drivers go through and what needs to happen with the car that i could actually see him doing a very good job being a team principal and helping direct strategies of where things need to go because it was very clear at the start of the year aston martin had a very quick car it's not very clear they have a very quick car right now yeah i mean everybody had that rumor last week that it was because of some uh fia ban and i can't subscribe to that um i do think if lance spent a couple of years especially if it was a successful bid in WEC, would actually provide that rounded out understanding of the wider context rather than getting in the car and driving around in a circle um, I think that could be it could be interesting uh, maybe with a bit of a side helping of getting an MBA in there because if you're going to be team principal you need to think about sponsors and stuff like it could be I, I just don't think he I don't think he is ready for it I'm not going to say the word capable but I don't think he would be ready to take it out Mike Crack is going to be upset because Mike Crack's the team principal right so I think you, you need some you need some time to get there and I think t- that involves to a certain extent time away from F1 I, are you allowed to drop out from being a driver and immediately become a team principal I don't see why not like regular Okay, it, I'm thinking I'm getting confused with the FIA regulation where you can't drop out of a team and join the FIA in some meaningful position within, like, was it two years or something? Right, but we had, like, Otmar just, like, <laughs> get replaced mid-season, so there's no reason you couldn't replace a driver and a team principal. True, 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 true. true. I will concede your point. Uh, and the one thing about Aston Martin's current team principal, whose name I've already forgotten, I feel like he's the one team principal we never hear from, and it's very clear, like... We know... No, no, no. I'm going to dispute that. There's been a number of Mike Crack interviews he's done. He's been on the Off the Grid podcast. He's done a couple of interviews with the various things. I think it was a few weeks ago. Well, he's never on the pit wall. No, but Toto's never on the pit wall. Oh, that's true. Uh, we do hear from Gunter. We hear from Zach. But we do get Toto in like in like after race interviews and stuff. True, true. And I think we get them from Mike Crack too. I just, I don't think that the team has been newsworthy if that makes any sense um maybe maybe he's just a quiet 
kind of person. I swear there was an interview with him yesterday about Lance and what was he doing. And Mike was like, you know, blah, blah, blah. We talk with people, et cetera, et cetera. Volatile situation, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe he's just so stealth. You just don't see him in your in your sphere. Maybe he's reasonable and that's why. There's no spiciness. Yeah, just like there's no spice in their car and it keeps going backwards. Shall we move on to some racing? Unless you want to give any career guidance to Helmet Marco. Oh, yes, I forgot this point. I'm terrible. Sorry about this. Uh, this originally started out while writing this as Marco, where is he? We haven't seen him for at least three races since he said something really unpleasant about um, uh, Sergio Perez. And then just as we were getting ready to go on air uh, for all of you lovely, lovely people, uh, I saw that there was a post showing a picture of him with Red Bull celebrating the win. So he's clearly there, but I think maybe he's been stopped from talking to the press. Uh, I don't know whether this leads credence to your theory about the cost cap. But we shall see. No, it leads credence to my theory of his role is being reduced and eventually he'll be asked politely to leave Red Bull or given a nice golden hand parachute, you know, to get out of the way. For the cost cap. Not because he's a boss. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's the official reason and there's the unofficial reason. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, so, Sprint. Um, there's a Sprint race. Sprint. Uh, we had... I think weirdly we're going to break down this race by talking about the sprint shootout and then the sprint race. Yes. And then race quality and the race, despite that's not the order it all happened in. No, but that's the connective tissue that binds this story together. Very true. Uh, so first, I'm going to make a general meta comment over the weekend. What was up with the timing, timing tower this weekend? It was missing for most of the beginning of the sessions. It was never what you wanted to be at the time you wanted it to be. It was particularly bad this weekend. I was very disappointed. The one time we want tire life on the timing tower and it never showed up. I know. It's always on there and it's there when you don't want it because nobody cares. It doesn't really matter until today. And then it did. So shootout. What happened in the shootout? Well, it was all topsy-turvy upside down around the houses. Um... We ended up with McLaren in P1 and P2 on pace with nobody else getting screwed up and nothing going horribly wrong for anybody else. Um, the last time this happened was Jensen Button and Lewis Hamilton in Brazil in 2012. 2012. Shocker. Yeah, I don't really have. Yeah. I have overall thoughts about McLaren, just not necessarily in, in shootout. In shootout, yes. Um, this is the problem with too much racing going on the weekend. You're not quite sure where to bundle the narrative. Yeah. Uh, Max couldn't get up there. I was kind of surprised that uh, after his performance on Saturday, again, doing this in the backwards order, uh, that he was on the Friday that he was not able to get up to... He was P3, right? Yeah. I think he was P3. Yeah, I think he was just trying um, to keep it somewhat interesting for the championship. Yeah, he's been lazy. Uh, thinking about his cats and playing some FIFA or whatever the new FIFA game is. And what, uh, what souvenir he had to bring back to Penelope. Very true. Very true. It's very difficult to think of those things. Um... Lewis just couldn't stop getting his laps deleted, I think more so than everybody else. And on top of that, even his best lap was not good enough to be anywhere meaningful, uh, which was kind of a shocker. Uh, I actually, in hindsight, personally, quite like the 10 minute, 10 minute, 10 minute qualifying. Uh, it was it was nice. It discouraged a bunch of weird driving around and getting stuck in the way because no matter what you need to do, you need to get around and get your laps done. Um, I kind of wonder if maybe actually that's what we should do for the real qualifying. Well, I, I do think it's a bit weird for like, uh, like if it was the regular sprint shootout qualifying of like the what, 15, 12, 10 or whatever, 18, 15, 12. Uh, it's always weird because the qualifying for the sprint race ends up longer than the sprint race. Yeah, that's which, which is very weird. Um, Carlos was on another podcast because he doesn't come on our podcast. Uh, talking about what to do about the sprint race weekends. And he thinks, you know, if you want the sprint race to be something different, uh, reverse championship grid for the sprint race. And that might be somewhat interesting. I wholly think that's the right way of doing it because I think it gets you back the time. His his complaint was, in the, was kind of in the context of how much time it takes to deal with it all. Um, and I kind of think that in the context of giving people the two free practices, which I think is actually important, it would give you back that and it would put relieve a little bit of pressure on the teams and in the context of you know 25 million race um season i think that probably would help um and i think it would actually be the most entertaining it can be and i think people have dismissed it in the past but we've tried enough ways that i feel like it's justified in trying it for at least one race yeah i think the other thing would be like if you had the practice session in the morning be like a practice qualifying session essentially where sure we'll just go out and you can do like 60 minutes of running if you want to work on your long run pace and check strategy sure but you know the fastest time you set in the session 
throughout the session is going to be the grid position. So you get kind of the, that hybrid of, yeah, there's some qualifying going on, but also maybe a team wants to check out their long run pace and see how they see how they go. So teams still get a chance to work on that with their data. Cause this was an exceptionally weird weekend. If you think about it, because we had a track that was essentially brand newly paved. Um, that was weird English, uh, a, a newly paved service. Uh, and there was one practice session before you went into a qualifying session, before you went into another qualifying session, before you went into a race, before you went into a race. So by the time we got to the race on Sunday, there was not that much data about like what the tire life was going to look like or be. Um, skipping ahead to the race a little bit with all the safety cars, Pirelli didn't get all the data for the tires that they were hoping to get out of the sprint race to make a better decision of what to do uh, on Sunday. And then you go even further on that, like on the one hand, because it's also brand newly paved surface, like the tire degradation is going to change drastically from the Friday session to the Sunday session as the track gets more and more rubbered in. So very weird set of circumstances this weekend for sure. And on top of that, the, the practice was during the day. Like it was not, it was not a representative situation, either temperature, weather, etc. wise either. I think that also made a big difference. Yes, I think it was, it was very strange. I think Carlos has a point. Maybe Carlos should go to the FIA after Ferrari get rid of him because apparently he broke his fuel system, but not to preview the race. Uh, so how do we think the race went in the shootout? Uh, no, God, Lord Almighty, this is a terrible name. How do we think that the race went for the sprint? Um, it was definitely one of the more exciting sprints we've had. Um, a lot of people just exiting the track via their own accord and getting beached in the gravel uh very very fun a lot of safety cars uh george russell just kind of was like oh i'm gonna use these soft tires and go really fast and then uh what there was the safety car where he was <laughs> it's like i think we need to come in a box we definitely need to come in a box nope george stay out this is a terrible idea we need to come in a box but i'll do what you tell me to do it's like george what the hell man <laughs> yeah it was I the thing, the thing is, is I think he was making the right call, but I feel like he communicated it in the wrong way. But I think the the thing that always bothers me is like, do they not have these real conversations before they start the race, right? Like, like, so we're gonna go with the soft. If it does degrade and this happens and this other thing does the thing that it does, we should do this. And instead, they seem to end up with like this dynamic strategy conversation. It's like um, Bernie Collins, I think, did an interview, or maybe it was the uh, former Sauber strategist did an interview where she's like, we compute every probability before the race we run all the scenarios we create all the strategies and we just knock them out as we as the race evolves as it happens each one gets knocked out as not being applicable anymore so that you get you know the best the next best the next best strategy and this for me is like a situation of like like did you not discuss that with like the team did george not get the information about what those strategies were i mean you know we we, we rag on ferrari plan j plan j and you're like well, what what's plan j i have no idea like george is like i've got i've got i've got plan two i've just made it up which is why it's not a letter it's a number now it's, it was very strange it definitely strikes me as one of those things if, if if they are running all the scenarios it's like well three safety cars on a sprint race that's not gonna happen we'll just toss that one out right before it happens extremely high tire degradation that's not it's not gonna be that bad we'll just toss that out because you know it's all about like the data you have and if they didn't have enough data on on how those tires were degrading like you just you miss your edge cases yes yeah, exactly it's those edge cases and nobody's thinking hard about it uh so yes the track was super soft oh uh, sorry the track was evolving it was super green it took out everybody's softs um but yet there was still some some very strange other things that went on i thought uh why did piastri just leave such a massive gap to allow allow his entitled and lord self george russell to get straight through it was just like hi there's a big gap please have it and go past me I feel like that was almost one of those, I don't think your tires are going to last. And they're like, sure, sure, go go burn them out. We've talked before about George has a tendency to overdrive the car. And like when he got two seconds in like half a lap, it was something crazy like that. And it, and it very much it very much felt like it's like, sure, go, go, burn out your softs. It's fine. Go, we'll, we'll come back. Do we think Piastri is at that level of strategy yet? I think he might have enough people on the pit wall that are informing him that he is at that level Maybe. of strategy. Maybe. And we just didn't hear the radio. I can believe that. Uh, speaking of Piastri, I thought it was also true in the race, not to preview the race. He got caught napping twice this weekend on the restarts. And I just think he doesn't, I think that is a rookie thing that he hasn't, like that intuition of like, 
oh, I, I, I need to be like really ready for this because it's going to happen and at any moment and Max is going to absolutely try to drop me by surprising me. And then he did twice. Uh, I think actually twice in the restarts he did that and then he did it on the um, on the race as well. So I mean, Piash is looking really good, but he's still definitely a rookie. Yeah, he's still got, he needs those little, uh, those edges to be softened and yeah. smoothed out. He, he needed to spend like a season in like a midfield car, maybe like an Alpine to really adjust to yeah. this sort of thing. What? Well, that was the plan. The McLaren was only supposed to be in the midfield. It wasn't supposed to be at the front. I mean, it wasn't supposed to be at the back like it was, so he was looking in a bad mood then. But now it's at the front. He had no time in the middle. That's true. They, they just went right from the back to the field to the front of the field. <laughs> exactly. You know, that's what Lewis has been doing over the last 15 years. He started at the front of the field, and it's just been slowly but surely moving back to the very back of the field. So guaranteed next year's Mercedes car going to be down the back. I'm thinking of how long it would, if, if that is true, how long it would take Lewis to actually slide down the field. Is it going to be like 50 years before he's actually in a backmarker car? We'll see. We'll find, we'll find out next year. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, speaking of Lewis, uh, he was like nowhere for the entire race until after that last safety car. And then it was like, Boom! um what happened i think the the take that's my take was during the race i think afterwards it was clear the fact that he was doing that thing that he does so well which was looking after his tires um, bono my tires bono my tires again uh what else have we got here um perez involved in another race ending incident um ultimately it wasn't his fault but he's always there he's never not av- he's never avoiding the race ending incident if there's one involved whether he started it or not yeah, it's definitely one of those, like, there's the, with the thing of if, if he didn't have bad luck, he'd have no luck at all sort of thing. But at the same point in time, there are a lot of very good drivers on the grid. And, like, just to just to talk about, like, Lewis and Max. Like, Lewis threw out his seven championship run. Max kind of threw the last two. Um, he was definitely more aggressive going for the first one. But it, it was very much seems like a, I don't need this one place right now. I have bigger goals to think of. And they were willing to back out of the move and maybe get it on the next lap or even in the next race and be like, yeah, you know what? P2 is good enough today because it's not because 18 points is better than zero points. Maturity is about maturity. And I, uh, and we kind of led with it at the top of the, the podcast of, uh, would you rather have Perez or Lance Stroll in the Red Bull or, or co- who could outpace who in the Red Bull? And man, I don't know. I think, it, I think Lance could actually go faster than Sergio in that Red Bull. Would you, but in, in when they were in the same car together, who out qualified who the most? Oh, that was years ago though. That was years ago, and Stroll has had mentorship from two world championship uh, teammates True. since then. True. Not that it's doing very much good at the moment. No. Um, uh, my take, to be brutally honest, is I think I would rather have Perez in my car. Um, I don't think he could maybe go as fast, but I think he's probably more predictable. And soon enough, Perez will realize that his role in life is not to win the championship. And then he will be a good lap dog for the rest of the team. Yeah, I, th- I think at this point, though, it's like, would you rather finish P11 or P12? <laughs> I was about to say, I was about to say, well, clearly you'd want, and then I realized that it doesn't make any difference because then Max is just going to still win the championship. Exactly. You, so, yeah. you know, it's going to carry the whole team. I still think they could just save a whole bunch of money on one one car. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at this point, they are uh, what Max has 433 points and the Mercedes team has 326 points. And I and I can make a comment of like, well, you know, Checo is soaking up some points, but not that many points. <laughs> the, the thing that I think is so shocking about Perez's lack of performance is not so much what it means for him. But the reality is Max has had nobody to play defense for him. Yeah. And so he's just had to do the whole thing. And that, for me, is the is the greatest failure of Perez. It's not just that he's not winning the championship. He's not fulfilling his purpose and role in the team. And I think that's just that's just why you... It's terrible. No, no, he needs to sort something out. Let, let's hope that Mexico and Austin, his two home races give him a morale boost yeah say what you will about like uh valtteri botas version 4.0 or whatever the whatever number we were on but at least he was always like right there waiting for or like right behind lewis able to be the teammate as necessary botas is the greatest second driver or one of the greatest second drivers of the entire history of f1 i think there are others like um rubens uh Rubens Barrichello was very good, but I feel like the thing that was different about Bottas is I think he genuinely actually pushed Lewis, right? Not consistently and all the time, but he did make Lewis have to go try sometimes to get that car on pole. And I think that that is, 
that's kind of the difference between a good a good and a great second driver man it's talking about fixing platitudes uh uh and faint praise uh but like i feel like that was a difference like he did a good job um, so we're not throwing uh nico rosberg in that co- conversation then no that we will talk we should talk we should talk about nico um later possibly you know let's add that to the spicy takes and rumors section uh in the meantime, let's talk about qualifying, which happened on Friday before any of the stuff we just talked about happened. Correct. Uh, but pretty much uh, we talked about kind of a lot of the big stuff. Uh, Lance was seen shoving a trainer, which didn't go well. No. Nah. Um, I, I do think I do want to try and play out a little story for us about think what has happened with respect, respect to uh, the World Endurance entry and Lance, why he's been on, on edge this weekend and how unfair um, he may or may not have treated his... Are we, are we going to get a a harp sound effect for uh, our time traveling to Dominic Storyland? I can look into that, uh, and I will see what I can make happen. All right. Uh, so, setting the scene. Uh, Lance Stroll is coming into a meeting with Lawrence Stroll. Um, he's been called into this meeting. Um, he doesn't really know what it's about, but, like, it's bad. So, you know, fam, eh? Right? It's all going to be good. Uh he gets in and he sits down and there's his dad, there's Mike Crack and some dude he's never met before. Uh, dad tells him, look, Lance, we're not firing you, but you're out at the end of this season unless you can score points in every race between now and then. And you have to make it into Q3 in every qualifying as well, all until the end of the year. That's what I'm setting it on. You need to be able to do that. Lance, ever concerned person, says, what am I going to do, dad? I need a job. And dad already has a story lined up for him. He says, don't worry, son. This is Barry or whatever their name is, who is going to run our WEC program. And he's going to start working with you on your F1 performance and then to prep you for WAC in, in 2025 after you're out. Ohana, Lance. We believe in Ohana. Because it's just a family story. He just wants to make sure his son has the opportunity to be success. And he's going to provide him with all the support. It's just like getting a math tutor, right? Let your parents get you a math tutor, help you get through maths right? This is the same. He's getting him an F1 coach to put him in WEC, and then we can slowly bring him into being part of the, um, the F1 team principal world. Or somewhere in, yeah, somebody's got to manage the empire. Exactly, exactly. But it needs to be, it needs to be the, the racing empire, to be clear. Uh, Why spend that money buying a race team if you're not going to keep it in the family? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, does does Roger Penske have an heir to the the Penske race team yet? I don't know. I don't know. That's a great question. Okay, so now my story time is over. Uh, please write in if you'd like more story times. We have to have some off-season content. Exactly. Uh, Chico didn't make it into Q3. Again. Uh, again. Yep. Uh, and as you said, he doesn't usually do well in... He does usually pretty well in countries that do uh, sport washing, such as Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that was the best comment of, of Cheka usually performs well in, in these sorts of human rights violation countries. <laughs> takes one to know one. Anyway, <laughs> uh, track limits were a thing, apparently. Screwed with everybody. Uh, I appreciated Oscar Piastri taking it on the chin. As he was kicked off the, uh, uh, the qualifying interview when it turns out he had a five-second penalty. Uh, and credit to Naomi, uh, who does a great job interviewing people. I was very pleased. They said it was going to be Nico for the qualifying, but it was her. I think she did a great job. She's pretty good at what she does. Yeah, and then I think most of all, Max just laid down. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think most of all, Max also just laid down one of his absolute qualifying markers where it's like, yep, that first lap was good enough. You all can go try to catch it, but you're not going to. I, I love those. I always, watching when uh, the Mercedes was performing well, I always thought the Mercedes would do that, but they never did. They never had the confidence to be able to go, I got this. Yeah, the, the, that's, just a, that's just insane to be like, yep, nope, that one was good enough. You're not catching it. And if you do, good on you. Save your tires, save your engine. It's all good. The, there, have multiple, there have now been multiple times where Max has done that, where he's been like, nope, that was the best lap I could have done. I'm going to the pits uh, and I'll be ready for the interviews if I needed. Exactly. Should we move on to the race? Oh, what a race. What a race. Uh, it was important that we had a retirement before the race started. Uh, Carlos's fuel system was apparently broken, and it was nearly a retirement for Leclerc because he apparently had to get a new energy store out of his allocation. No penalties. Um, uh, I think this proves yet again that Ferrari's famed reliability shines through. 
Wait, wasn't that... And it's good reliability or bad reliability, but their reliability shine through. Wasn't that this season where his energy store lasted one race? Yes. How did he have another one, like, and then he was already on his backup one and already took a grid penalty for it? How, how did he have another one in his allocation? Yeah, you have two, I think. Yeah, he burned one out in Bahrain. He, like, his second one was damaged in Jeddah, and he had a grid penalty in Australia. Apparently they must have fixed it. I don't know the details, man. I'm just telling you what I heard on the television. That's fair. I'm just the messenger. Uh, do we know if uh, Charles had an alibi for uh, the issue with Carlos's fuel system? No, but the suggestion was the curbs did it. Ah, uh, the curbs. Like the Charles Leclerc's? Exactly, Charles Leclerc. Yeah. I'm just saying, if, if, you're, uh, if your position of the number one driver at Ferrari is in doubt, it'd be a shame if something happened to your, uh, the other driver's fuel system. But Andrew, Andrew, we know that Charles Leclerc's position as the number one driver at Ferrari is absolutely not in danger. It, you could bring back the ghost of Michael Schumacher to race the car magically, uh, and then it would still be number two to Charles Leclerc. So uh, just to be clear, in, in our podcast, we are saying that Michael Schumacher has been dead since the skiing accident? No, okay. I am not saying that. I'm saying that to be able to drive it at this point, his ghost would need to return. Okay. At this moment, he's unable to participate in driving. That is probably true. Um, we alluded to it. We talked about it earlier. That turn one crash. It was amazing. I it was <laughs> the only thing I, I can am think so of... annoyed. At, I am so annoyed at Lewis Hamilton. I am very upset. I will refuse to be his friend anymore. I need at least two weeks to get over this. The only thing I can think of is Lewis thought George was going to tuck back in behind Max. Yeah. I, it's... And he didn't. Yeah, I mean, credit to Lewis as well, both in the interview on the radio where, uh, not on radio, mid-race before he he hadn't seen the replay, but he said he took full responsibility at that point. Um, He has since tweeted and posted after the fact um, that he watched the replay and it was, he was saying it was 100% my fault and he made the mistake. Yeah, just like going onto the grass in Spain in 2016, it's all your fault. (laughs) Did he admit that it was his fault in 2016? Probably not. Not in that championship battle. No, not in that championship. Um, I do think that in some ways this is possibly a low-grade statement by lewis trying to teach george that he can take responsibility for making mistakes because lewis pretty quickly took admitted full responsibility for that yeah uh i don't think george is going to learn that lesson no um one side point i saw related to the crash uh maybe a more meta point that i saw just before we came on air uh apparently this is the fifth or sixth time in this season where somebody's had a light touch on a rear wheel not that they crashed, but the whole rim of the t- of the wheel from BBS breaks off and like comes away, causing the tire to come off it, causing a a more significant accident and potentially a situation where the car could have otherwise maybe have continued if it could have got back to the pits with a puncture. Uh, and it's interesting because I remember seeing on other cars the whole like you can see the metallic edge of the wheel. Um, so I wonder if they're going to fix that for next year because I think that would be great if people could you know gently nudge each other and not end up completely ruining the race, because I'm still mad for taking a good race away from us. That's all your fault, Lewis. Yeah, uh, I I messaged you at one point in time during the race, and it's insane to think of how good this season would be if Max Verstappen simply did not exist. Uh, Like, because think about it, in the closing laps of the race, we had, first of all, we've had the McLarens come back from the back of the grid to suddenly the, to like two, two two double podiums in two races, essentially. And like, they were Lando or yeah, Lando was asked to hold position and maybe if he hadn't asked to be hold position could have overtaken Oscar. Like, did he hold position though? I'm not sure he was doing that. Yeah. That's on the one hand, I feel a little bad for Lando Norris because it's this case of like, he can beat his teammate when it's Daniel Ricardo, but the car's crap. And at the back of the grid, they get rid of Daniel Ricardo. They bring in Oscar and suddenly Oscar seems to have the measure of Lando and is only getting better. Indeed, I've been very surprised by Piastri's progression. They've said he was the second coming of third coming, fourth coming, uh, whatever it is, the, the, the appropriate deity that you support, um, that this that this kid was going to be amazing. And I was kind of surprised at the beginning of the season that he wasn't, especially when you, even in the same car compared against Lando, but he seems to have got his act together. Um, still rough around the edges, as we said, but yeah, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, I think we've talked about it before, just like how little testing time they have for those F1 cars. And especially as a rookie, like it's insane how little time they have to try to understand how this new faster car works. Uh, but Oscar did, we didn't even mention that he won the, the sprint, sh- the sprint race. And 
Uh, yeah. So, so he now technically has more wins than Lando Norris. Yes. By half is what I'm going to say. Cause I don't think we can, cause we don't count sprints as like Grand Prix wins. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it was interesting. Lando took it on the chin and was very clear. He was blaming himself for screwing up, which I think is a very uh, interesting and probably sensible way to do it. It's not like that guy was better than me, which I feel like is admitting defeat. It was more like I need to do better, which I think is a much better approach. Um, Compare and contrast to George uh, Russell and his perspective. The Aston Martins had quite the race. They did pretty good, actually. I think all in that they showed more pace than they should have done. I don't think they had good pace, but I think they actually showed more pace than they could have had. Fernando loved to explore the entire circuit. Oh, man, that was that was a classic rejoin. I loved that. That was so beautiful. It was like everything was wrong about it. It had speed. It had closeness. It had nobody paying attention. It was, it was amazing. It had... It was just great. It was brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Red Bulls. We can talk a little bit about them. Max, uh, he didn't quite just go off into the distance, but he very clearly had the race in control. Mm -hmm. I think he was, in all seriousness, I think he was probably actually trying to manage himself rather than the race, given how hot it seems to be, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, But I feel that was probably part of what was actually going on, not just that he didn't want to run away with it slash managing his tires. Um, plus I think his comment after the race was like, I don't like this forced stop thing. I could have gone a lot longer and gone faster, but you know, here we are. Yeah. Uh, and let's not forget, he could be slightly dehydrated from a little bit of celebration on Saturday night for clinching the championship. Do do you think that he's allowed to get absolutely rat assed on after that? Or do you think they were just like waiting for tonight? So he's got two weeks to recover. I think they're waiting for tonight for sure. I think Christian, Christian said something, I think on the before race broadcast of, yeah, they had a little bit of a thing, but no, they weren't going to do anything crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's the problem with winning a championship on a Saturday. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, speaking of Christian Horner, uh, do you think he had a really good laugh when um, Lewis took George out? Yes. Thinking thinking about the challenges he has with his own drivers, I think I would rather have the Perez underperforming problem than two drivers constantly taking each other out. Um, we should also not forget that Zach Brown is sitting in the corner going, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Yes, I was just about to say, is uh, Zach Brown vis- being visited by the, the ghosts of races yet to come? Indeed, I think he is. It's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, so, uh, But w- did... once again, on the on the Mercedes comment, of, I think we mentioned this before, is if Merck get that car under control, George and Lewis are just going to take so many points off of each other throughout the course of a season. Yeah, the, the only... I think we briefly talked about this, but the only thing that gives me pause on on wholly subscribing to that, I'm only buying the digital subscription. I'm not, I'm not buying a print subscription to that. Um, is that? I mean, it is 2023. It is 2023, but I'm not so willing to be. I, I don't want it for posterity. Um, so I just need the digital ephemeral, ephemerality of it. Um, that Lewis, when he gets a car and he's in a good mood, will dig really deep. And I do wonder whether that will be what separates them or whether we're going to end up in a terrible situation of a repeat of 2016. And I just don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, I don't need that stress in my life. We had Gasly overtaking multiple cars while going off the track and then being like, no, I don't need to give the place back. I was surprised by the second time he did that, that he got a penalty for that one, but not the first one. Uh, And that kind of makes sense in my opinion, because like, I don't think he gave, he even attempted to give the second one back. And it was one of those, no. you know, you do it once, shame on you. You do it twice. All right, we're really going to the stewards. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what Alex, I think, had a good race. Both the both the Alpha scored points, uh, Botas and they, Zhao. They did? Yeah. Did they? Oh, that was pretty good. That's good work by them. Yeah. I was. That's, that's kind of surprising. Um, uh I, I learned on, during my travels that apparently uh, Finland has as many cars as saunas. So it makes no, uh, it's it's very obvious that Baltas would handle a sauna race very well. Does that not imply an average of more than one sauna per household? I think the, it's, I think it's pretty much exactly one sauna per household is about where the, the numbers lie. I see, I see, I see, I see. That, that, that's a fascinating stat. Though. Yeah. Finland was an interesting country. Uh but did you finish your trip there? But um, I did finish my trip there. Comedy. I, I would like to say you are at least the tenth person to make that joke. Really, yeah. I'm glad I have made. I have successfully followed in the. You get of great you people. get one point for finishing tenth. One point. Un point. And speaking uh, of points, okay. the uh, 
Hey, how about that segue? Uh, the McLarens are doing very well. They are now 11 points behind Aston in the standings. They're 79 points behind Ferrari and 170 or 107 points behind Merck. Like, I think they're going to catch the Astons. Yeah. Can they catch Ferrari? I think I think that's dependent on Ferrari. <laughs> so they're going to catch Ferrari. Um, yeah. And the Mercs might be just a little bit out of reach, but... Not if they keep repeating the driver to driver performance they had this weekend. That's true. If if they keep scoring points with only one driver, be it going for gaps in Singapore or um or yeeting each other off in turn one, the uh, they could catch them. They could, and that would be. I think that would be pretty shameful for Mercedes. Not because they got beaten by somebody else, but they got beaten because their drivers can't get along with each other. Well, also, Lewis gained three points on Sergio this weekend overall. So Lewis can take because yeah, because of the sprint points. The sprint points. Yes, 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 uh, yes. And if Lewis does not win a race and overtake Sergio in the championship, he'll be like the first driver since like 1970 something to become runner up in the championship without winning a race. Man, that sucks to be Lewis. Still not willing to bring my friendship back yet. That's fair. But I feel sorry for him. That's okay. He's going to win Brazil or something. Um, I do think it's important at this point that I should uh, point out that I'm going to have to eat a hat and admit that McLaren actually really fixed the car. I know I was like, ah, yeah, you got to see it for a number of races, but they are so consistent with their improvements that they really did fix that car. And now all I want to know is what they did to fix it. I, I need the backstory. I need the, the expose podcast where they go into details about exactly how it came about. Uh, you'll get you you won't get it for a couple of years just because of the yeah. regs. Maybe. Uh, do you do you know which McLaren hat behind you on a wall you will be eating? Uh, let me inspect. Ah, uh, oh, I'm gonna be really spicy. I'm gonna have to eat a Daniel Ricciardo one because he doesn't drive for McLaren anymore. I was wondering if you're gonna. Uh, I was thinking maybe a Jensen Button hat. I do not have a Jensen Button hat. If anybody has a pristine condition jensen button mclaren hat i will happily purchase that off you so i can eat it <laughs> yeah uh we should talk about a little bit about the track just uh yeah just to round off because i think we talked about the drivers the track um i i still think this is uh bahrain if somebody asked you to draw it from memory yep wholly subscribe to that at least most of the corners yeah um overall i do i do like this track but yes but yes i thought it was a good racing track as a design how it flows. I actually think the facilities looked good because they jazzed them up this year. They look actually really quite nice and modern and fresh. It was all, it looked all pretty reasonable. The pre-race light show but, was very good. I didn't see that. It was pretty good. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that's nice. Um, but I think it's in the wrong place and certainly at the wrong time of year. And I think they maybe should have done something with the track to let it have some running in before you slap new cars on it. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with all that. Um, apparently... Uh, Nico Rosberg reported, I saw maybe, or I think he's, he, it was him who reported. I saw this briefly on Twitter while you were doing story time, um, that apparently, uh, Pirelli warned the FIA about this six months ago and the FIA did nothing. Oh, if that's true, that's a shocker. They said, we're going to have problems. And the FIA said, no, nah. I don't understand. It feels so easy to, maybe solve's not the right word, but like, it feels relatively easy to manage. You go get a car. You go slap the tires on it and you drive it around for 100 laps and you say, whoops, this screwed the tires. And then you either tell the track to do something about the curbs, the, you know, two weeks beforehand, or you change the tires, which you, six months in advance, I think you've got plenty of time to have a go doing that. But apparently not. That's pretty shocking if that's the case. Yeah, there was um, what during COVID, there was the race at like Turkey or something where they were running cars around on like the, the track for like 24 hours beforehand to try to rubber it in just a little bit. Yep. Um, I, I, there was so much they could have done, and I feel that that's it's not shameful is not the right word, but it just so, shows it was relatively easy to do something about it. It was not the fact, like at least last year, was it last? Or was it Saudi Arabia that had the metal ones that were chewing up the tires as well? Um, but they were they were bad in twenty twenty one on this one, and they were chewing the tires up for I think exactly the same reason. And I'm like, you can fix this. It's called get an angle grinder out and take it all and fix it. I don't know why they didn't, and that's pretty bad. Yeah, uh, and also the list of driver ailments essentially from this tra- from this race is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, what uh, Lance and Alex apparently couldn't get out of the car. Fernando's seat completely heated up, and there was like, are, are they just going to dump ice on him in the middle of the race? Which would have been hilarious. Um, Oscar and Max apparently were just totally drained and exhausted. Uh, Esteban threw up in his helmet. Weber repeat of 2011. Not great. 
uh, Logan Sargent just said, I've had enough of this and I'm not scoring points. I'm done. And he, he also struggled to get out of the car. Yep. Uh, George said he thought he was going to faint, which makes sense. Cause on that last stint afterwards, like he was dropping so much time so quickly on what was supposed to be a very fast tire. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah. And this track has a 10 year contract, so it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the future. Yeah. I hope that it's better next year. This, this was pretty ridiculous. Um, I was, I was watching George going back and I was worried he was going to do a George thing of, I've got to keep going because I could get some points when it might not necessarily be safe. Cause he was falling quickly back into Leclerc's hands, but I think they all kind of pulled it together or everybody else had the same problem. So at least that was something, um, it did, did make me wonder if Lewis, before he got in the car, realized that this was going to be a total disaster and decided that what is to save face that he didn't look like a wuss. He just decided to t- take himself out. And he could have a nice, relaxing evening. Whereas everybody else is now recovering in hospital. The the only thing I'll say against that is drivers showed how to take yourself out without taking anybody else out during the sprint race. So Lewis could have done a better job of uh, not also sac- or sabotaging his teammates' race. But he needed a safe face. That's true. He, could, he has, to, has, to look like, has to look like it was George's fault to teach George a lesson. Two birds, one stone. Uh, what did you think of all the uh, the pit stops? It felt very much like kind of an Indy oval car race or an Indy car oval race or a, or a WEC race with like, well, let's see how this all shakes out after the last stint to see where everybody really is. On the one hand, I thought it was interesting. On the other hand, I feel like it is too tightly entwined with the causality and the boringness comes into it in kind of the same way. It's like, well, they're going to stop in three laps. Okay, so they're going to stop in three laps. Okay, stop. The The only thing that introduced a small amount of jeopardy or a small amount of confusion was they kept putting on used tires and it was unclear exactly how many laps each of the used tires had. Um, uh, see earlier point about the timing tower not having tire life on it. Um, but like, I understand that it kind of added a, something, an extra dynamic to it and it kind of was kind of interesting to see what would happen. But it didn't really change anything. I'm not I'm not sure it made a huge difference to the actual race itself. And that's what I keep coming back to with all of these different things. It's like, let's do something. And so it seems exciting in the middle, but actually didn't make any difference. The thing that really I found kind of interesting about this was they said, you know, the, the tire life is what, 19 laps, 18 laps, something like that. But they set the same thing for all the tires. So you're telling me that a soft and a hard are both going to explode at lap 19? essentially so did you did you see what the the the, like the minimal coverage of the actual science behind what was destroying the tire no okay so apparently it's as you go over the curb the frequency of the vibration causes the structure of this tire like the 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 way it's constructed right right right. to start to disintegrate which is why it was non-compound specific it's a tacoma's narrow bridge situation as a local reference for us yes yeah Tacoma, Tacoma tires. Yes. Uh, no, Tacoma trucks. Anyway. Um, yeah, uh, but I thought that was very interesting. Cause like if, if you had like, well, the hards can go this long, the softs can go this long. Uh, speaking of not riding the curbs, Max Verstappen was the only driver in the Grand Prix to not have a track limits violation at all. Lewis. Well, Lewis was number two. Um, as I, I, I was, I posed this question to you. Is this is this like the Formula One uh, game where it's like it only counts as a, a track limits violation when you come back onto the track? It is a track limits violation when the FIA has told you you have violated the track limits. Oh, okay. It's it's like your offsides in uh, in soccer when the uh, linesman raises his flag. Gotcha. Exactly. Nobody told Lewis he had a track limits. Not on his record. So he is the second driver to have not had track limits in the entire history. All right. Um, nonetheless, on a more serious point, I find that very fascinating and surprising. And I also think it says a lot about the fact that Max wasn't really trying. I, I think it also says a lot to Max. Max was driving to finish the race, and like that's why we didn't see him just go off into the distance because he was like, okay, I'll just keep it in the, I'll just keep it safe, keep it steady, and go. Uh, there was some great uh, Javi and Charles drama. I know we love to cover that on this podcast. Of uh, Javi was so uh, we are so we are going to pit next lap. Complete this lap. Am I pitting or not? No, next lap. Don't tell me when I don't have to pit. <laughs> <laughs> That's so Ferrari. It's so Javi and, and Charles. It's like okay, we're gonna pit in, in a lap and a, <laughs> in a lap and a half. So am I pitting or no? No. Don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, just it's great. I think that does point out the reality that uh, the real reason that Carlos could not participate is that Ferrari only had one official lap counter uh, and it was critical for this race that they get the lap count right. 
Um, and so they took him out to make sure that they could count their number one driver's laps. And even then, as you've just pointed out, it was a little bit sus because they couldn't even communicate it effectively. Oh, well, yeah. The, the joke before the race was, um, who's going to get disqualified and why is it Ferrari? Indeed. I'm still waiting for that. There's still a good chance that might happen. Anything else you want to talk about the race? I don't think so. I will go on to spicy takes and rumors. Yes, let's do it. Uh, should we start with Nico? Uh, Hulkenberg or uh, Rosberg? Mr. Rosberg, the curse of uh, Nico Rosberg, took out two teams or two drivers this week. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So Nico Rosberg has a curse. And that curse is that when he has a picture taken with him and one driver, that driver has a terrible race. Uh, and he did it with Checo. And he did it with Lewis. And what happened? Both had terrible, no good, bad races. I, I do love the, the Nico Rosberg curse. The only person who seems to be immune is Max Verstappen because he occasionally does take a picture with Max and Max just has so much skill that he can overcome a Nico Rosberg curse. Uh, or that he has so much of luck and that's how he's been driven to his success is through a constant unbounded amount of luck that Nico, while he diminishes his luck, it's still so, it's just so massive and that he's able to overcome it. Or, or is it one of those uh, Nico bad luck plus Yoss being there is like a negative plus or plus a negative is, equals a positive? So you're saying he 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 overflows Max in and wraps around? Yeah, yeah, because because Yoss is also Got there. Got it. Right. Got it. I will subscribe to that yeah. theory. Uh, what else? Uh, I have decided that um, despite my not being a fan of Max, uh, he is a goat. Uh, I am aligned with Max's race philosophy. Uh, on the podium, he was asked by David Coulthard, should we bring in mandatory st- pit stops? It made it such a great race. And Max is like, I prefer to push the tires as long as I will make them last. And I'm totally agreeing with that. Like, let the driver and the team do the thing. Show skill, right? Show skill. It's not It's not about luck and a random number generator. Yeah, I think Max was also saying he, could, he felt like he could move those tires a lot. It was interesting kind of in the middle of the race when the drivers realized, like, Oh, these tires actually have a lot of life in them. We can push really hard for like and know we and know when everybody's pitting. So it almost kind of made the race like a bit of a non race in a sad way because there wasn't that degradation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um I would also like to point out that Lewis stole a great race from us because if he'd been in it and he'd been able to do his tire thing, think what fun we could have had. It's your fault, Lewis. Your fault. Instead he binned it. Exactly uh next item i think this is yours. it is i think i think uh we have never fully known what lance stroll's contract situation was with aston martin and i think it is very likely i'm willing to say i think he's going to be out of that seat at the end of the year i think they're going to have somebody else come in i'm not sure who it is i think uh there's some interesting candidates out there if they can make the deals work like liam lawson would be really interesting um maybe vettel mentioned that he's not fully saying no to a comeback so you could get fernando and sebastian in the car together that would be interesting um yeah i think there's some and there's also uh what some f2 drivers i think you could also throw in there as well um so yeah it's it's definitely definitely interesting on where that's gonna end up but i don't think unless lance has a major turn of form in the last five or six races i i don't think we're gonna see him in that seat in 2024 i feel bad for him but at the same time things need to happen yeah I, I I think we've talked about it before of when you suddenly make a fast car, it's like, and it, it really exposes how much like Lance was only a second or so behind Fernando in Q1 of the race qualifying, but that's the difference between making it to Q3 and being out in Q1. Exactly. And exactly. You, you can't have that kind of gap to your teammate. Correct. Um, he did make some excuses that sounded a lot like Sergio Perez. Um, he was basically saying the car's kind of gone away from me and gone into uh fernando's uh style of driving and i always feel that i understand the factuality of that comment but i also feel there's a certain giving up on it aspect yeah uh my last spicy take and rumor i think our last spicy take and rumor is from me um i think even if lewis wants to continue at the end of 2027 26 27 25 well, he's got 2020. Oh, yeah, he ended 2025, right before the new regs. Um, even if Lewis wants to continue past 2025 into 2026, uh, I think Merck is going to decide not to renew him and encourage him to retire because I think they come to the conclusion that they don't want to fucking deal with this shit for the next 
three years of these people taking each other out and they need somebody who's going to be more reasonable and sensible about it uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how it's going to go down so we'll see yep shall we wrap up and come up with some crazy predictions sure uh i think lewis is going to drive the wheels off the car as revenge for being a dumbass uh, i think he likes austin that seems very likely he he yeah i really hope he does and i'm not expecting him to win although that would be pretty great if he could win in austin um i'd love him to see that and just sort his life out because that's 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 yeah speaking of somebody else who likes austin what about daniel ricardo as a points finish i think that's plausible given the performance of the car uh, assuming he does actually get to drive you saw he's doing a demonstration drive somewhere in the u.s next week I can't remember where it was. Yeah, they said I think he's doing a sim session this week to see to check the wrists, and I think he's yes, he's, but yeah. he's also getting in a real car and driving a real car on a real track, like a like for a demonstration drive, and I think that is also part of that recovery assessment. I suspect Liam Lawson is on speed dial. Yeah, uh, he has a super formula though at some point in time, doesn't he? Yes, and I believe is it Mexico? It, I think it's Mexico. And so I think that's really the latest we'll see Ricardo come back. Right. Um, you have uh, Perez underperforms. And my question would be, uh, I thought these were supposed to be crazy plausible predictions. Or are we saying underperforming even his current level of underperforming? I think he's going to underperform at his current level. But this will be shocking because it's basically his second home race of the season. Huh. Because there's a lot of his fans. And I think it will be shameful for him to underperform in front of his home fans. So, so you're just referring to Texas as occupied North Mexico? No. Okay. I'm saying that Texas has a lot of people from Mexico. It does. Either visiting or because they live there and they're going to come to support their, their driver. And he will underperform and not be very good at it. That's fair. Uh, then I think uh, I'm going to predict that Max wins. Not shocking. Oh, wow. What a prediction, Dominic. No, I fully agree. It's not shocking. But it's con- context for what I'm going to say next. But he will have to try really, really hard, and it'll be his most impressive drive of the season um, because Piastri will push him really hard, but then Piastri will flake out because he just can't do it with the whole race, and then Norris will come through and also continue to push Max, but Max will still win. I'll see it. I can add to that. I think we're going to have three different teams on the podium. Ooh, spicy. What three? Uh, Red Bull. I'll I'll say probably Red Bull, McLaren, and Merck. Okay. I'll even go uh, probably even in that order. Okay. Okay. Are you going to make you going to go for a bold prediction about which drivers other than Mac? <laughs> Perez. <laughs> what uh what what are the three most uh, or the three most unlikely would be uh Perez, Russell and Lando. Lando gets his first win. <laughs> there we go. Per- Perez comes in second with no excuse for being second. And Russell only makes it work because he's driven somebody else off the road like Max because he qualified second. Uh, yeah, which also leads into my last prediction of turn one chaos, which ha- is how Max is going to be out of the race. Yes, because last year, last year was ridiculous. Was it George that took out uh, Carlos? I mean, turn one in Austin's like a really good first corner because you're, you got the steamroll up the hill and then there's so many different lines to take. Yeah, turn one's usually pretty good in Austin. And then you got the S's right away. Is that really a crazy prediction? Uh... I think we've actually had very few lap one incidents this year. You are correct. So I will say for this season, yes. Okay, great. I will subscribe to that. We've done another episode. We have done a whole other episode. Uh, And I think it's this time to leave you all to have your calm and relaxing evenings, afternoons, or mornings. Remember, we are always waiting for your feedback at feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com where you can let us know your conspiracies, your feedback, and your wants. Also, tell your friends to like listen rate and subscribe to this amazing podcast and if you really want to see all the stories that we were talking about today you can follow our new instagram slash threads account tinfoil helmets i guess the seahawks are exploring their sexuality this week yes because they have a bye week